probably go for about uh, 30 or 40 minutes, hopefully, and then uh, leave some time for questions. So you could ask, you know, why, uh, you, know, you could ask why you actually need to know about adult congenital heart disease, given that the teaching's always been that if you get someone with complex adult congenital heart disease, you should uh, basically send them somewhere else, send them to a specialist center. And I think that still actually holds true. The problem is now that there are so many patients with complex adult congenital heart disease that you are going to stumble on them in your career, even if you're not working at a uh, specialist adult congenital heart disease center, they're developing non-congenital heart disease problems. So uh, something that I'm often asked, and um, so I guess I don't actually come at this by the way, claiming to be a specialist or an expert in congenital heart disease, but I've been the imaging cardiologist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital for some time now. Uh, at the Congenital Heart Disease Clinic. And what I've learned is what a useful tool, um, advanced imaging, particularly CT and MRI, uh, what, how useful they are to understanding congenital heart disease. And what I hope to do today is just show you a whole lot of pretty pictures to help demystify uh, some of these conditions. What I often get asked is when do you use which test? And uh, Basically, everyone gets an echo, of course, to start with. And I was an echo guy before I added MRI and CT onto that. And uh, everyone knows how good MRI is for looking at ventricular function and ventricular volumes. What often isn't appreciated is how good it is for uh, quantifying flow. So for example, here's a patient with aortic regurgitation, but you can quantify that very nicely by drawing a region of interest just above that aortic valve and deriving a very nice uh, flow curve and getting a regurgitant refraction. You can actually measure flow in any vessel. So for example, if you measure flow in the aorta and the pulmonary arteries, you can then derive a QPQS, a shunt fraction. What I really like about uh, flow with MRI is that if you do enough flows, you actually have a whole lot of internal checks which you can use to then ensure that your data is accurate. So for example, if you measure the main pulmonary artery plus the right and left, if that all adds up like it should, you know your data is uh, accurate. You can of course also do um, things like uh, MRA, so, um, or and that can be with or without gadolinium um, angiography. For coronary MRA, uh, basically CT is superior. So what we tend to use that for is um, things like an add-on to look for coronary origins or to follow up for coronary uh, aneurysms. I just realized I forgot to start recording this again. That's bad, isn't it? Dang. Oh no, it's recording. I think we're recording. All right, good. So with um, cardiac MRI, and you've got a whole lot of other sequences as well, all the things that you do for um, acquired heart disease. And the reason I mention this is that there really isn't such thing as just a standard cardiac MRI. You really need to know what the question is. Uh, you know, I report plenty of echoes where there is absolutely nothing written on the referral form. That doesn't work for uh, a cardiac MRI. You need to have a bit more clinical information. So please specify the question. What about cardiac CT? Well, um, typically MRI is our first go-to test, but there's lots of people with uh, contraindications to MRI. And even if implantable devices are actually MRI compatible, sometimes they throw a lot of artifact. So for example, here's a patient with a NAPCA occluder coil, which leaves this dirty great black hole on the MRI picture that you can see very nicely on the CT. And uh, that also goes for things like compatible or conditional pacemakers, which we can then scan. The, the actual generator box itself sometimes can throw a lot of artifact, even if it's MRI safe. If a patient's acutely unwell, uh, an MRI scan is a bad place for them to be. So we tend to go for cardiac CT there. But where CT really uh, we prefer is for looking for straight anatomy and, and particularly vascular anatomy. So here's a patient who's left upper pulmonary vein, we had trouble uh, following on MRI. Uh, but on CT, you can see quite nicely what's happened, that it's doing a 360 degree loop around that left pulmonary artery before ascending and um, 
draining anomalously into the nominate vein. So in this way, CT becomes a fantastic tool for uh, just working out what's going on and what's connected up to what, and uh, which is why I want to use it for a lot of this talk. So what I thought I might do is just go through a few common conditions. And this, of course, is not a comprehensive talk about all congenital heart disease, but just a few things that I thought, um, a few messages, I guess, uh, about uh, conditions that you are uh, possible to see and are worth demystifying. So atrial septal defects, you already know all about these. Uh, secundum defects, of course, sinus venosis, the unroofed coronary sinus, uh, I'll talk about some of these. Uh, what I wanted to point out is that your primum ASD is actually part of the spectrum of um, an atrioventricular canal defect or an atrioventricular septal defect or endocardial cushion defect. They're all syn synonymous uh, terms, but actually it's not really just an ASD. It's a much bigger deal altogether. And I'll mention that later on. Secundum ASDs, uh, these comprise about 80% of ASDs, and I don't really want to talk about these uh, very much. You've all seen these, um, and they're often suitable for percutaneous closure. I tend to prefer toe to actually um, determine that, but you can um, get a good idea about that on MRI and CT as well. What I really wanted to mention is uh, the other types, so in particular the sinus venosis defect which is depicted in, uh, here in this picture. It's actually a deficiency between the uh, right-sided pulmonary veins and the SVC uh, typically, although it can also involve just going directly into the right atrium itself, but it's intimately involved with the pulmonary veins, almost a defect of the sinus venosus tissue um, at the uh, front part of the pulmonary uh, vein. So anomalous pulmonary vein, venous drainage is actually part of it, but they can also have extra anomalous veins above that. So on these slices, if you can see here, uh, this is sort of the defect here where that's SVC, left atrium. It's come further up, you can see that there, and there's another vein draining anomalously as well uh, above that. The point to make with these is that you really can't see them reliably on transthoracic echo, at least not in adults. And so often they just present with isolated uh, right heart enlargement and you need to do something beyond a transthoracic echo toe or uh, even better CT or MRI. Uh, this is sort of a 3D picture of the same thing, seeing the anomalous vein coming and draining in there. And you can, there's actually a uh, intraatrial communication associated with that. And often they're very large shunts uh, and sometimes they have pulmonary hypertension associated with them. So here's just a little case example, 51 year old man, who was noted to have a dilated right ventricle on a routine transthoracic echo. He'd actually had a PCI to his LAD several years uh, previously and had quite good exercise tolerance and things and had actually been followed for cardiology issues for a while. Uh, because of this dilated right heart, um, which was had probably been present all along that they sort of paid more attention to, uh, he had a toe at a country hospital which showed a dilated right ventricle and a VSD. Now already that should sort of make you think something's not quite right here because VSDs typically don't cause right heart enlargement. It's pre-tricuspid level shunts that tend to cause a dilated right ventricle. You'd more expect a VSD or a PDA to cause left ventricular dilatation, not right. So he was actually referred down to the Royal Melbourne and the first um, test he actually had was a cardiac MRI. So there's cine views, left ventricle, right ventricle, obviously markedly enlarged. And you can see nicely, he's got uh, this sinus venosis defect with this anomalously draining uh, right upper pulmonary vein there. So my point to make here is that, so this guy's 51, had lots of things done to him before and has missed all the way uh, along. So do think of uh, sinus venosis defects in the presence of unexplained right heart enlargement. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that if you see a dilated right heart and there isn't some other obvious cause, like severe TR or severe pulmonary regurgitation, uh, you should really exclude a pre-tricuspid level shunt. Um, there are other causes, of course, just bad pulmonary hypertension, ARVC and so forth, but your mission should be to exclude a shunt 
So you can also get anomalous pulmonary venous drainage without an intraatrial communication, that is without sort of a sinus venosis a defect part. And these are actually commoner than you uh, might think. Uh, they result in a left to right shunt, a bit like an ASD, but the shunt is stable because it doesn't change with your changes in you know, relative atrial pressures, for example, or change in your left atrial pressure. So, uh, so here's a patient with an anomalous left upper pulmonary vein that's draining into the innominate, and here's a sort of time resolved MRA that's been put into a 3D, which shows that quite nicely. This really isn't that uncommon. We turn this up, you know, really not um, infrequently, and I think it gets missed a lot because you can't even see them on transesophageal echo. Um, so that uh, unless you do a CT or an MRI and actually go high enough, uh, these get uh, these will just get missed. So with MRI, um, you can also then calculate the degree of shunt associated with the anomalous pulmonary vein. So this is a 50 year old lady we scanned only a couple of months ago, and we measured flow in all of these uh, different vessels. And we can do this very quickly at the Royal Melbourne with um, the sort of the software and hardware that we have. So we tend to peel off a whole lot of flows and then see if they all add up and um, good fun to work out what's going on. But the QPQS here came out as uh, 1.6 to 1, comparing the aorta and the main pulmonary artery. But you can see there's lots of other flows that we can then use to check that calculation, if you like. You can actually measure the left vertical vein directly as well. Uh, and the shunted blood is included in the SVC as well. So there's lots of different internal checks for that. Moving on to ventricular septal defects. Now, I don't actually want to talk about these very much, ex except to just to mention the terminology, which is very, very confusing, as you probably know. There's all these different, uh, there's a couple of at least major different schools of uh, nomenclature for congenital heart disease, and it gets particularly messy around BSVs. The way I think of them is just in sort of four simple groups. You've got the perimembranous defects, which you've all seen are quite common in your uh, very well. You've got the muscular ones, which are in the trabecular part of the septum here. Then you've got the outlet uh, ones near the pulmonary valve, and these tend to be of two different flavours, either the sort of doubly committed juxta arterial ones, that is right uh, below the aortic and pulmonary valve, or the malalignment type, which is typically what you'd see in uh, something like tetralogy or follow. You can also get then VSDs of the inlet uh, portion, and these can be extensions of uh, VSDs that are sort of classified in other ways, but inlet VSDs are also part of what you see in the AVSD or AV canal defect spectrum that I mentioned uh, earlier on. So just to talk more about those a little, this atrioventricular septal defect, also known as a AV canal defect, it's the abnormality of the entire atrioventricular junction, as you can see on this um, CT image here. And in fact, there's typically a common AV valve, and whether you call it a partial or a complete, or whether there's a primum ASD component, uh, plus or minus a inlet VSD component, just depends on the attachments of that common AV valve, in that if it's attached to the crest of the ventricular septum and there's no ventricular level, uh, shunting, then it would be just a partial AV, AVSD uh, or AV uh, canal defect. Uh, we often, you probably know that what tends to go along with a uh, AV canal defect is a what's often referred to as a cleft mitral valve. What the cleft actually is, is a gap between the superior and the inferior bridging leaflets that you can see here. So this is a normal patient up the top here. Uh, this is a patient with an atrioventricular septal defect. Rather than a proper tricuspid and mitral valve, they've got this superior and inferior bridging leaflet. And the cleft is just a gap between those two things. So in fact, this isn't a mitral valve and shouldn't be referred to as a mitral valve. So we don't call them that, we call it left atrioventricular valve and right atrioventricular valve. The other thing that you see in AVSD is that the aortic valve isn't wedged between the um, 
tricuspid, the right and left AV valves as it is in a normal heart. It's sort of sprung up, as you can see, there isn't this sort of divot that it sits in. And that results in the sort of slightly elongated left ventricular heart outflow tract, which is characteristic. So uh, moving on to tetralogy of Fallot. So we all learnt about this in med school as being uh, sort of four separate conditions or sort of four separate things, a pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular hypertrophy, an overriding aorta and a ventricular septal a defect. All of those four things actually arise from really one specific abnormality, and that's anterocephalad deviation of the outlet portion of the ventricular septum. You know, ventricular septum sort of grows from the top and the bottom, and in this case, they don't line up uh, quite right. So with that anterocephalad deviation of the outlet bit, that leads to the pulmonary uh, stenosis and the, you, you get the, the aorta then overrides the septum. Uh, our right ventricular hypertrophy is a consequence of that. And of course, you've got the VSD because of that malalignment. So it's really one thing. CT actually becomes your friend in terms of working out what's been done because you can see calcification of that VSD patch. And if you look at this heart otherwise, it doesn't necessarily look all that abnormal, but you can see how this once might have been, that this aorta is actually overriding the ventricular septum. This is where the VSD was and the patches have been put in place. Uh, it would have been compressing the right ventricular outflow tract to varying degrees. So sometimes that needs to be opened up and the right ventricular hypertrophy would be a consequence of that. There are, however, a lot of other things that go along uh, with tetralogy of fellow. So basically it's quite characteristic that they all get this sort of rotated aortic root where the left main coronary artery arises very posteriorly and the right coronary artery tends to arrive very anteriorly. They can also have anomalous coronary arteries in addition to that, for example, the LAD coming, uh, coming off the right. They've usually got uh, funny pulmonary uh, arteries and there's a whole lot of other things that can go along as well. But the echo doesn't necessarily look that wildly abnormal in someone with repaired uh, tetralogy. In terms of the complications to look out for in people with repaired uh, tetralogy of fellow, there's all kinds of things that we look for. But the one to really emphasize is uh, this one, pulmonary regurgitation. So this is a patient um, from our clinic. And this is their pulmonary valve, repaired uh, trapezoid tetralogy of fellow. And you can see this is the main pulmonary artery, here's the right and, and left uh, PA. Um, excuse my dog in the background there. <coughs> um, so the question is how severe is this pulmonary regurgitation and this often gets under uh, sort of underestimated um, in centers that aren't used to looking at this this is actually severe almost completely free pulmonary regurgitation and it can be underestimated because it is so brief there's basically no restriction to uh, the backflow at all and so just one very brief red sort of jet. If you look carefully, however, you can actually see the reversal flow going right out into this right and left branch pulmonary veins, which is one way of telling that it's uh, probably severe and you should always do a continuous wave Doppler through as well. You can just see the density of this single and the pressure half time. This is this patient's uh, right ventricle, which you can see is uh, enormous or way bigger than the left. If you've ever got any doubt about whether someone's got severe PR, you can then quantify it on MRI by that flow technique that I was showing before. So what we tend to use MRI for more rather than actually sort of uh, confirming severe pulmonary regurgitation is helping to time pulmonary valve replacement in patients with uh, severe PR. And you know, most patients with repaired tetralogy do have severe PR. I almost assume that they uh, kind of do. So, and they can go along for a very long time and uh, be asymptomatic, but after a certain point, uh, the RV doesn't recover if you leave it too long. And in general, sort of these numbers get thrown around. There's, there's data that shows that if your right ventricular end diastolic volume index is more than about 150 or maybe 170 even mils per meter squared, your uh, right ventricle is less likely to come down in size after pulmonary valve replacement. Uh, 
Uh, other indications would include um, sort of an end systolic volume index greater than 80, which in some ways is uh, an index of deteriorating right ventricular function, or also reduced uh, left ventricular function as well would also be an indication to go ahead and replace a severely regurgitant pulmonary valve in someone with repaired TET. Uh, the point is that if you wait for symptoms, it's usually too late. You need to get in there before that typically. These aren't really bulletproof numbers, by the way, and the availability of percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement uh, has really changed this quite quickly, and I wouldn't be surprised if these thresholds all fall quite um, dramatically. But nonetheless, MRI is quite useful for quantifying and uh, symptoms basically are too late. So, for example, this is a, uh, the kind of story that we see all too frequently. A 30-year-old man with tetralogy of fallow who had his initial repair in infancy he was followed up uh, at an outside hospital and uh, was thought to have just mild pulmonary regurgitation. He was finally referred to uh, Royal Melbourne when he became symptomatic. We uh, determined that he actually had severe PR. I think this is playing a bit fast, but it's just basically free wide open pulmonary regurgitation. And this is his right ventricle, enormous and now dysfunctional. And, and he almost missed the boat. We had all kinds of arguments about trying to get, um, trying to actually get him to surgery um, but um, eventually he uh, eventually he did get an operation has done all right but he needed his pulmonary valve uh, replaced about a decade ago so uh, moving on uh, next condition i want to talk about was transposition of the great arteries or dtga if you like so this is ventricular arterial discordance. So your aorta is arising from your right ventricle and your pulmonary artery is arising uh, from your left. And in order to be survive, you have some other type of uh, communication or otherwise you have to get an atrial septostomy performed uh, immediately uh, after birth. So in this condition, it's quite easily recognized because one, your aorta is anterior, which it usually isn't, but also the two great vessels are running in parallel, which they usually don't. They're usually sort of running uh, sort of perpendicular to one another and you never see the two AV valves in the same play. So you can tell immediately that this is some kind of transposition. And here we can see a right ventricle giving rise to the uh, aorta and the coronary artery from there. So the way this used to get repaired was by a mustard or sinning procedure. So this is where you basically redirect the venous inflows. Uh, you baffle the SVC and the IVC across to the morphologic left ventricle, and then the pulmonary venous return uh, then goes around the back to the morphologic uh, right ventricle. So you've got a circulation that works, but what you have is ventricular arterial discordance that remains, and you've got your morphologic right ventricle that's supporting your systemic circulation. So these operations were done in Melbourne uh, between 1968 and about 1981, roughly. So uh, the patients, the youngest ones we have there are almost say, late 30s and uh, the oldest are now getting into their sort of uh, early 50s. So this is what um, it looks like on CT. So here's your SVC here that comes down, it's baffled over to your morphologic left ventricle. IVC also baffled across to your morphologic left ventricle. This here is actually your pulmonary venous baffle. And as you can see on the sort of corresponding image here, the intraatrial septum previously would have been running somewhere across like this. So it's almost like they take down the back of the intraatrial septum, or at least that's how it looks and the pulmonary veins sort of drain around the back. So this is your pulmonary venous baffle. Now, the main problem with this is the right ventricle is supporting the systemic uh, circulation. So heart failure becomes an issue uh, further down the track. And the other thing is that your tricuspid valve goes with your right ventricle, just as your mitral valve goes with your left ventricle. So typically that tricuspid valve is under systemic pressure, which sometimes it doesn't handle so well, particularly in the, in the setting of a dilated right uh, ventricle. And this is, a, um, so this is the left ventricle here, and here's the right, which is systemic. This is what it looks like on echo. The transducer isn't flipped around the wrong way here. This is correct. So this is left atrium, left ventricle in the subpulmonic position. This is your morphologic right ventricle in the systemic position. That's uh, very dilated. 
similarly sort of there. And then here, if you have a look, this thing here is your morphologic uh, left ventricle and a parasternal short axis type view. And this is your right. And you actually want your morphologic LV to look like this, be compressed and almost be a banana shaped in that uh, you actually want it to look like this. If it looks like this, you've actually got a problem. So here's a patient with a severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is something that we're seeing um, in our mustard and sending patients now, which is a real problem. Uh, they don't seem to handle it uh, terribly well. And in particular, they um, then, rather than being candidates for heart-only transplantation, they then require a heart-lung, which is a much more difficult thing to actually uh, get, of course. So you want uh, it to look like this, or this, the morphologic LV to look compressed like that. As I also mentioned before, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, which is systemic AV valve regurgitation, uh, is a big issue in these patients, as you can see um, in this example here. <coughs> in terms of the baffles, SVC baffle obstruction is really quite common. About 30% of mustard patients um, have it. What happens is that uh, it blocks often at the SVC RA junction, so somewhere around uh, at this point, and then the blood decompresses down the azagus and goes into the IVC. And that can actually be missed on echo in that if you've just got narrowing of the baffle, you can usually see that uh, high velocity flow. But if, you, if it's completely blocked, and then sometimes you can actually miss it on echo because there's no sort of, uh, there's no fast blood flow to see there. Um, it's a particular issue if you have to place either a pacemaker or an ICD, which you often do need to. So we tend to use CT to look for baffle patency in uh, some of those patients. This is a reconstruction of a CT with a obstructed baffle. And if you actually think this gets windowed out, this blue thing, and you can see here that there's actually a very short obstruction just at that uh, point uh, there. You can also do it on MRI, of course, say with a time resolved um, MRA. Baffle leaks, uh, they basically behave a bit like, well, the way to think of them, I guess, is a like an atrial septal defect. The direction and degree of shunting then depends on the relative pressure on, uh, on either side. So nowadays, though, we don't fix transposition of the great arteries with a muster or sending, they typically would get an arterial switch. And I think these were first done in about 1981 um, in Melbourne. So what happens here is you basically transect the aorta, aorta, uh, aorta and pulmonary arteries and then put them back in the right position. Uh, so that sounds fantastic. Um, and it is. However, there are some potential problems that you need to follow up um, based on these. And so in particular, if you look at the place where it's transected, I, I don't think I could specify exactly where that is, but you can kind of think of it as being almost at a sinotubular junction uh, level. So the pulmonary root, the original pulmonary root, then becomes the neo-aortic root, and the original pulmonary valve becomes the neo-aortic valve, and that tells you what some of the problems could potentially be in the future. The reason this operation couldn't be done earlier on, um, as in, in decades prior, was because they couldn't handle the coronary arteries. These tiny little uh, coronary buttons, uh, they had trouble reimplanting. This operation is typically done, I think, within the first 10 days of life. So you can imagine they're just little threads and it's uh, amazing they can actually um, do this at all. It has quite a characteristic appearance. So if uh, in association with that, they've had a Lecomte uh, maneuver, the PAs are then seen sort of draping over the ascending aorta. But importantly, uh, look at the ventricles. They actually look pretty normal. Um, so you don't have a big hypertrophied right ventricle because it's where it should be and it's doing the job it uh, should be doing, the subpulmonic. So this is what it looks like on, uh, on MRI. This is the ascending aorta, descending aorta, and here the PA is draped across it. And there is a risk of branch PA stenosis uh, because of this the PA sort of straddle the aorta. You can actually get obstruction to the pulmonary arteries on at any level along there. So for example, this is a patient with supravalvular pulmonary stenosis, which is actually at the suture line where they joined, uh, where they did the, uh, the switch before. The other issue that comes about uh, is, well, there's several other issues, but 
uh, with the coronary arteries which have been re-implanted. So if you look down here, this is actually the original aortic root. And so this is where the coronary would have once been coming off. They usually come off what's called the facing sinuses. So the ones that are closest to the uh, original pulmonary artery. So basically the button's been taken off here and put on here and similarly on the other side here, but just out of plane, uh, which you can see below. So you can see that then they're at risk of sort of uh, impingement or kinking, but also patients with uh, a post arterial switch do seem to have an increased risk of other coronary problems. Uh, I actually don't fully understand all the details of that, and we haven't seen a lot of that in Melbourne, but uh, certainly that is something that you need to watch out for. Uh, the other thing that uh, I alluded to earlier on is that your neo aortic root is actually your original pulmonary root. And often that doesn't handle systemic pressure all that well, and you can get progressive dilatation of that uh, neo aortic root, which then can result in uh, significant aortic uh, regurgitation. And you can certainly quantify that nicely on MRI. So um, lots of things can do still need to be followed up with uh, an arterial switch. And I guess that's one thing I wanted to point out in that a lot of times I've heard it said, oh, they've had their congenital heart disease repaired. There's almost nothing in adult, in congenital heart disease that's completely fixed and you never have to think about complications of it again. There's probably a few conditions, but most of them have important sequelae uh, that you need to uh, watch out for. So, Detransposition of the great arteries isn't to be confused with this. This is congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or CCTGA, sometimes referred to as LTGA as part of a different sort of nomenclature uh, and sometimes also called ventricular inversion. This is atrioventricular discordance and then ventricular arterial discordance. That is your atria are connected to the wrong ventricles and then your ventricles are connected to the wrong uh, great vessels as shown in this diagram. It's, it's a bit like two wrongs making a right, but only sort of, because although you do have two separate circulations that actually work, once again, your uh, right ventricle is the, in the systemic position. Now this has been described as, you know, the most important complex congenital heart disease condition you need to know as an adult cardiologist, because often they're diagnosed in adulthood, uh, their circulation works, so they might only turn up once they develop heart failure, or they develop complete heart block. And in fact, um, they've got a predisposition to that. And in fact, anyone, a young person who develops complete heart block, you need to think about whether they've got CCTGA. So this is what it looks like. So left atrium here. This is a morphologic right ventricle and there's ways you can tell it's a morphologic uh, right uh, ventricle, which we can go into later on, uh, ejecting out into the aorta and here's the coronary artery from there. And here's a cine view of uh, the same. This patient hasn't had any uh, surgical uh, work done. So as I mentioned before, it's the systemic, so, uh, it's the right ventricle that's then in the systemic position. And in fact, on CT, you can work out this whole anatomy or MRI, if you like, quite nicely. This is a left atrial appendage, um, which you can recognize by its shape, meaning that this is a left atrium. You can tell that this is a left ventricle by its smooth superior septal surface. And there's other ways you can put the thing together, but uh, you can work out the whole anatomy uh, from this. Often the heart's in a funny position as well. So in this case, immediately behind the sternum, which often leads to terrible image quality on echocardiography. Uh, here's a uh, patient with CCTGA. I think she's in her 50s. She's never had anything repaired, of course. She came to attention because of complete heart block. And uh, you can see the pacing leads here sitting in the subpulmonic ventricle as they're, as they're meant to be. And you can see how this can be missed. So this is her four chamber echo. It doesn't look that wildly abnormal, but this is actually a morphologic right ventricle. Uh, and this is a morphologic uh, left ventricle. And there are ways you can tell this is a parasternal long axis view and you could actually get fooled by this. There's no actual connection here at all that this is the, uh, this is going to morphologic RV that then ejects out anteriorly. So often missed. And in fact, the oldest patient we've diagnosed with CCTGA at the Royal Melbourne was a 75 year old lady 
in a nursing home. Um, so she'd obviously done fine for most of her life with that, but they don't always do fine. Uh, they often develop uh, various complications such as heart failure at a younger age. So uh, just finally, the group of conditions I want to talk about, we've got a few other small slides, I guess, is um, the patients who are described as having a single ventricle. Uh, the thing I wanted to point out is that most patients with that label actually do have two ventricular chambers that you can sort of identify. It's just that one of them isn't large enough to support either of the circulations, either the pulmonary or the, uh, or, even, or the systemic or even the pulmonary. So for example, here's a patient with tricuspid atresia. This is where you expect the tricuspid valve to be, but there's a fat plane coming all the way uh, along here and they've got a very large VSD. And this thing is just kind of a rudimentary uh, right ventricle, but this would be described as a functional single ventricle and something similar over here. You can see two clearly distinct uh, ventricular chambers. So, the uh, most of the patients with a single functionally single ventricle uh, if possible uh, the surgical sort of palliation they have uh, would be a fontan and um, you may have come across this term but i hope this is not too basic for you but basically a fontan circulation is where you're doing without a subpulmonic ventricle you essentially connect the svc and the ivc to the pulmonary artery somehow without passing through a ventricle. So the way this was originally done was just connecting, say, the right atrial appendage directly to the pulmonary arteries. This is called a uh, atrial pulmonary fontan or a classic AP um, fontan. But you can imagine the problems that come about from this. So here's this patient with tricuspid atresia again. Here's the right coronary artery, massive right atrium. Uh, and therefore there's a risk of sort of thrombi forming with that and of course arrhythmias and uh, all kinds of other problems, pulmonary vein compression as well actually, this patient's got uh, down here. What's been done more recently since about the mid 1990s in Melbourne is the uh, extra cardiac fontan, where you actually have a tube uh, that connects your IVC up to your pulmonary arteries. That's sort of the final step in the fontan completion, uh, this, this sort of Gore-Tex tube, the bit before that, is uh, something like a bidirectional glen where you anastomose the SVC to the pulmonary arteries. That bidirectional refers to the fact that your pulmonary arteries are confluent, they're not disconnected as they were in the original sort of classic glen operation. Uh, this is what they can look like on MRI where you've got the flow coming up the conduit going into the left pulmonary artery here. This is how it would look like uh, on an MRI scan, sort of in a four chamberish type view if the patient had four chambers. So uh, all patients with a Fontan really do need to be cared for at a specialist um, centre. It's actually amazing that their hemodynamics work at all. So their pulmonary blood flow is all passive under a pressure gradient. So that means they have to have very, very high uh, systemic venous pressures. And that leads to all kinds of troubles, not just dilatation and arrhythmias with this, but they can develop protein losing enteropathy. Cirrhosis has become a really big issue in our patients um, in that they all have somewhat stiff livers, but a lot of them have progressed to frank cirrhosis, which is a bit difficult to pick up. And we've now had uh, quite a few patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, of course, that's all a disaster because then it uh, complicates all their other therapy or a transplantation or anything like that. Uh, plastic bronchitis seems to be something that more happens in kids with a uh, Fontan. There's lots of things with imaging in particular we need to look for in um, the Fontans and some of these things here, veno veno collaterals and AP collaterals, often which are better seen on uh, CT. I find pulmonary AVMs, uh, fenestration, pulmonary emboli, I particularly uh, want to mention in that we often have our patients who are breathless and then turn up to uh, other hospitals and get a CTPA and it's rarely diagnostic or if, uh, if it is, it's often called massive pulmonary emboli because of the way the blood doesn't mix because it's not passing through a subpulmonic ventricle properly, you often get massive filling defects on one side. So it's often quite hard to actually uh, exclude pulmonary emboli well in these patients. We usually do a delayed scan uh, looking for recirculation of um, that. So something to watch out for um, CTPAs in patients with uh, with the Fontaine circulation.
So a particular group of patients who we're going to see a lot of uh, with a Fontan circulation are those with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So this was all this was universally fatal till about 1990, until they developed um, operations such as this, the Norwood uh, procedure. And there's quite a few bits to the Norwood procedure, but the bit that uh, I guess wanted to highlight here is that you essentially use the original pulmonary trunk to create an outflow from the right ventricle to the uh, aorta and then you join it to the original native aorta. This is the native aorta here, this tiny little thing and the reason you need that is because the cor coronary arteries um, arise from it. So, so here's the patient with hypoplastic um, left heart and I think we could identify a small little LV chamber somewhere in a different slice but basically it's just one massive big uh, right ventricle and then eventually they have a uh, Fontan, Fontan completion with that. But uh, so we're going to see a lot of these patients um, in the uh, in the future now that uh, sort of uh, yeah, now that they're all surviving into adulthood. Actually I should mention by the way with the Fontans I did talk about the classic AP Fontan and the extra cardiac. There is something in the middle the lateral tunnel Fontan which you can think of as sort of being halfway in between a tube that goes through the right atrium we don't seem to have all that many of those um, in Melbourne, though, that I've uh, come across. Uh, so uh, the one other, one, um, other term that I wanted to sort of throw out there is the Danis K. Stanzel connection, which it just looks particularly funny, so I wanted to show it in some ways. It's where you connect both your aortic root and your pulmonary root to the aorta. So you've basically got two aortic roots effectively that eject out into your aorta. Uh, so a version of the Danis K stance is actually used in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, kind of joining the uh, the new ventricular outflow to the near to the original aorta as I showed here. So that's also called sort of a, a Danis. But uh, this is the other time that you use that uh, this term is used where you're joining the two roots together. And this is often done to overcome subaortic stenosis. Uh, here's a patient with a very aneurysmal DKS that we uh, that we had. Uh, and just finally, um, the other terms I was hoping to demystify is uh, sort of the palliative shunts that you may stumble across. So the Blaylock uh, Taussig Thomas shunt here. So this is from your ipsilateral, your subclavian artery to your ipsilateral pulmonary artery, and all of these are a way of just getting some sort of uh, pulmonary blood flow. Often I think they're done in patients where you can't use a, a venous shunt because the things aren't, they're too young or their pulmonary vessel resistance is too high, uh, things like that. Waterston's shunt is uh, ascending aorta to the right pulmonary artery and a POTS shunt is then you're descending aorta to your left pulmonary artery. This is one of our adult patients who the single ventricle that never had Fontan completion, I think because of uh, elevated pulmonary vascular resistance See, this is actually his BT shunt, and he's also got a POTS shunt around here that you can uh, see coming out. Somewhere if it comes around this side again. Over this side here. Uh, so, and just finally, heterotaxy uh, syndrome. So these are really complicated, but I just wanted to mention that they exist. We're actually not meant to be symmetrical in that, um, our right and left sides are meant to be different. So we all know that you can have situs and versus where everything's flipped over the other side, and that's not necessarily associated with any significant congenital heart disease. Uh, situs altus is normal, but you can also have bilateral right-sidedness and bilateral left-sidedness, and that applies to your atria, your thoracic um, structures, and then also your abdominal viscera. Left atrial isomerism is also known as polysplenia, uh, has a number of things, usually has an interrupted IVC because that's sort of a right atrial or right-sided structure. And then you've got right atrial isomerism is often known as asplenia and they can have actually very severe uh, congenital abnormalities or often have more severe congenital abnormalities. Um, and in fact, if you 
your approach to patients with a completely undiagnosed complex congenital heart disease, that's actually step one to determine that visceral atrial situs. And then you can go through and identify the ventricles, the connections, the great arteries, and there's all morphological features that actually allow you uh, to do that. And you do it the same way on echo, MRI or CT, just wherever you see it best. Got a few other bits that go into this, but I think I'll stop there. That's enough of that stuff.